some of my students are in trouble, and this is what I heard. I'm a week or two behind on my project, but I've also got to catch up on my lectures, and there's an important coursework deadline on Thursday, and there's another one next week, and I'm working solidly every day, and I'm hardly getting any sleep, but I'm still always behind. Help! There's just too much stuff to do. How can I cope with this? Welcome to Frank's Diano Explains. I'm a professor at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of Trinity College, and in these roles, I look after a number of very talented students, but even those top performers end up being overwhelmed. And that opening statement was a paraphrase, or let's say a remix, of something that a number of my students told me in our weekly meetings last week, now that the pressure of the academic year is beginning to mount up. It doesn't matter how good you are, all successful people have to face this fundamental problem that there is too much to do and not enough time to do it in. And coping with that is not a skill that universities typically teach you. Many very clever people go through university working very hard, but without really being in control. They let themselves be driven by deadlines, like a tiny boat slapped here and there by big waves in the middle of a storm. And it's not just university students. Many professionals, too, are overwhelmed by the list of things they ought to do, that they seem never to have enough time to complete. It's very much a universal problem. How can we deal with it? How can we go to bed satisfied? without the guilt and stress of thinking that there's a million other things that we should have done today before signing off. Hang around and I'll tell you some of the stuff I told them, which I hope will help you too, whether you are a student or not. If you find my content interesting, I would really appreciate if you say a small thank you at no cost to yourself by hitting the like button on my videos so that more viewers get to discover my small channel. These final year students are under quite a bit of stress, but this situation is in fact beneficial to them. Because it's a miniature version of what they will experience later in life. If you have the wisdom and maturity to recognize that, then you should treat this situation as a playground, where you get to experience the challenges of professional life in a safe environment, where you can discover and practice some strategies to cope with them. The content of what you actually do is ultimately less important than what you learn about how to handle these situations. And developing useful strategies for dealing with too much to do is going to pay dividends for the rest of your life. During your undergraduate degree, you're usually at a stage in life where you don't have big responsibilities. You don't have a house, you don't have a mortgage, you don't have a spouse or children or other dependents. You don't have employees whose salary at the end of the month depends on how well you're steering the company and so forth. It's just you. And nothing much happens at the end other than the fact that you get a degree, which by and large you will get anyway, no matter what. Perhaps with a slightly different number written on it. But, you know, 10 years later, almost nobody will care what your score was at university anyway. So, even though your time at university, while you're in it, might seem very challenging and very stressful and so on, it's actually a safe playground and it's useful to just step back and acquire this perspective. It's useful to understand that it's okay to make mistakes and it's very beneficial to experiment on your own skin and to learn what works and what doesn't work in terms of time management. I mean, there are some things that people can tell you, people can teach you, books can explain and so on and so on, but it only really clicks when uh, you experience uh, you experience it personally on your own situation. Because the one thing that won't change throughout your whole life is that there will always be too many things to do and too little time to do them in. And it's up to you to learn how to deal with that in a way that lets you achieve what matters to you and ultimately makes you happy. So our problem is that we have plenty of things to do, all of them very important, and there isn't enough time to do them all perfectly. A seemingly impossible task. So where do we start? main insight here is to apportion time to important things in proportion to how important they are. And how can you quantify how important they are? Well, by figuring out the payoffs you get for doing them, according to whatever metrics matter for you. If you're at university, which we view here as this toy world where you get to practice the problems you will face later in life, then uh, things are made easy by the fact that your deliverables already have marks assigned to them. You know that at the end of this particular lecture course, you will have to do an exam and the maximum you can get for that exam is 20 marks. Okay. Whereas the final year project will get up to say 80 marks. I'm making this up. But, so uh, the project is worth four times more than the exam. Okay. But maybe you have to do 12 of these exams worth a combined 240 marks. Plus you have to do the project, which uh, we said was worth 80 marks. So overall you have like 320 marks and the project is worth a quarter of your total marks for the year and so forth. And you get the idea. So at university, it's easy to see what's important and exactly how much it is important because there are clear rules about the relative values of your various deliverables. 
In real life, it's not quite so easy. And it's going to be up to you to figure out how much this to the item is worth compared to this other one. And you know, this task, if you do it well, might uh, result in you getting a pay rise, say 5k per year. So that's how much it's worth. And this other thing, if you do it well, might, might well be worth a promotion to a different role where you will get maybe 15k a year more. And this other thing, if you pull it off, um, will allow you to be so successful you can buy the house of your dreams. Okay, this other thing, if you can stick to it, will let you publish a book or will let you get your overweight body back in shape or uh, win an Olympic medal or get a woman of your dreams or anything you like. So anyway, it's up to you to assign quantitative values to each of these. And of course, not all of them will be easily convertible to a uniform scale like the marks of the exam in the project or a currency or any common unit you might come up with. But even so, you must somehow put yourself in a position to compare their relative worth to you according to your own values so that you can then prioritize them accordingly. If you've already watched that other video I did recently about the most valuable thing I passed on to a former student of mine, you know that since your available time is a limited resource, you should do your important things in preference to your unimportant things. And that's pretty obvious when you say it like that, although not many of us manage to do it in practice and you know, we end up spending too much time doing unimportant things. But here we have a slightly different problem, perhaps a harder problem. How are you going to do a bunch of things, all of which are important? You're not allowed to say, I'm not going to do this because it's unimportant. You're not allowed to drop any of them on the floor. They, are all, they all need to get done, but there is too little time to do them all. It's impossible, right? Well, it's useful to let yourself be guided by the relative value of these important things. If we go back to the toy world of uh, your university duties, okay, you've got this finally a project which is very important and very challenging and very interesting actually, and it's the kind of open-ended thing that could easily soak up all the time available. You could easily spend all your time on just that very interesting, exciting project and keep making it better and better and make it really amazing. But would it be the smart choice? Well, perhaps not if it meant you neglected all your other important items. Because remember, the project was worth a quarter of your total marks. But the exams about the coursework were the other three quarters. So if you do the greatest project in the world to the detriment of studying for your exams, you might bag the maximum marks for the project, but you will never get more than just a quarter of the marks from that. And so in total, you'd get 25% and you'd fail the course, despite having done the best possible project. So the message here is, don't starve any of your important activities. Make sure each of them gets a slice of you, okay? A bit of your time, a bit of your attention, a bit of your enthusiasm. Make sure you make some progress on each of them so that when you run out of time, which you will at some point, everything that was important and absolutely needed to be done has been done to at least some satisfactory level. And of course, if you get to the stage where you've done all these things to satisfactory level before you run out of time, then feel free to go back and improve from satisfactory to good to very good, to outstanding for some of them. But first, bring them all up to a level where if you have to stop there, it'll be acceptable, okay? You won't be ashamed of what you produced because that's a much better situation to be in than the one where you make the first deliverable absolutely perfect, but you drop the other ones on the floor. When you keep making one thing better and better, yeah, of course, you get more credit for it, but at some point you get diminishing returns. If you get this deliverable to 80% good, you might get good credit for it, but to raise it from 80% to 90% good might involve just as much work as going from 0 to 80%, and you definitely won't get twice as much credit for having done that. And I, I'm of course hand-waving about these numbers, which are totally made up, but you get the idea. Get all your important things to 80% good first, before you get obsessed with making one of them 90% or 95% or 99% or 99.2% and so on. Otherwise, it's obvious why you're not able to finish them all because you're a perfectionist and nothing you ever do will be good enough for you. We all have a bit of that tendency in us. In a sense, that's what makes us good, but it's a tendency you have to resist. So say no to perfectionism if it gets in the way of you delivering on all your important things. If there's a bunch of things you've decided must all be done, then perfectionism is your enemy, especially when you consider that beyond a certain level, nobody except you will actually notice the difference. So kill perfectionism. It may be in your nature, but it gets in the way of getting things done. How should you schedule your work to ensure that all the important items get done? Well, to be honest, there isn't a single answer that works for everyone. Some people work better one way, some people another way. Some people need a very strict plan. Some others work better 
uh, if they fly by the seat of their pants. But in any case, in terms of the big picture, at the strategic level, it makes sense to allocate time broadly proportionally to the value of the activities. If your project is worth a quarter of the marks, give it a quarter of the time. You might make a rough allocation where you know your five workdays a week are one day for the project, which is a quarter of the marks, three days for the coursework, which is the other three quarters, and then one day of slack or buffer or to account for the unexpected or emergencies or stuff that might not go to plan. Okay, and then you know that if it's a Tuesday, let's say the designated day for the project, then you do your project and you should make good progress on it and not waste any of the precious time of this Tuesday because, you know, you won't have another chance to work on the project until next Tuesday. And that's one way to ensure that you stay balanced and that the effort you put in is broadly proportional to the payoff you're going to get. So give more effort to what is worth more, but still ensure that all the items get done, at least to some basic acceptable degree by their respective deadlines. Having said that, at the strategic level, be ready to be flexible at the tactical level. We are humans, we are not robots. So sometimes you're working on your project and it's going really well and you're in the zone, you're writing code effortlessly and it all makes sense and it just works. And if you were to stick to your rigid plan, uh, at the end of the Tuesday, you'd have to just stop there and work on some totally unrelated coursework the next day. And you'd leave that coding aside until next week, at which point you will have to refill your mental cash and waste several hours to get back in the zone, assuming you're lucky enough to get back into that same inspired state the following week, which might not even happen for all we know. So then given that, perhaps it makes more sense to continue coding the next day when you're in the zone, taking advantage of that moment of inspiration, and at least go on until you reach a natural breakpoint. Say, you know, you finish the module and it passes all the unit tests, which would be the programming equivalent of having finished writing a chapter of a book. And then you can set aside that task and get back to your other stuff. And maybe you compensate by doing more of the other stuff the next week instead of working on the project. So appreciate that we are humans and that creative work needs to be treated differently from mechanical repetitive work. Sometimes the creative work just doesn't come out, even if you've got a whole day in front of you. And if you're in that situation, then once you realize that it's probably better to do some of the other stuff you have to do rather than waste one precious full day to trying to get the creative stuff going when it's not working. And conversely, when you are in one of those blessed, inspired moments of creativity, you should milk it for its worth and allow yourself to continue beyond the allotted time while it's going well. So, in summary, be flexible in your day-to-day -day management of your time. And when your creative juices are flowing, let them flow. But when you go up to the strategic level and you're planning the month and the year instead of just the week or the day or the hour, then let yourself be guided by the relative worth of your various activities and set some boundaries to guarantee that you make progress on all your important items. And kill perfectionism, as we said, which gets in the way of actually shipping your deliverables. If you care about time management, you will probably like this other video. If you have any questions about time management, programming, computer science, how to learn effectively, or any of the other stuff we usually discuss on this channel, then ask me in the comments. You will bring a smile to my face if you hit the like button and say impact the drill in a comment to let me know that you watched till the end. Thank you very much for enjoying Frank's Diana Explains, and until next time.